Let's run an experiment. Say that you have two magnets on a table such that the north pole of one magnet is facing the south pole of the other magnet. When you release one of the magnets, it will fly toward the other, accelerating as it goes, until they snap together. Now rewind that tape. In reverse, the magnet flies away from the other one, much like it would if they were oriented north pole to north pole. In fact, it is fairly difficult to tell the difference between a reversed video of two magnets flying together and a normal video of two magnets flying apart. As it happens, the same is true for electrons. Electrons are fundamental particles with an electric charge of negative one. Like all particles of matter, they also have a counterpart, a particle of antimatter with an opposite charge. The antimatter electron, known as a positron, has the same mass as the electron, the same spin, but the opposite charge. Instead of negative one, it exerts an electric field with a charge of positive one. This difference is very similar to the north and south poles of a magnet. As such, if you were to watch the behavior of an electron under the influence of an electric field and compare it to a rewound video of a positron in an electric field, they would appear similar. Furthermore, all electrons have the exact same properties, which is strange when you think about it. Even mass-produced items will have slight variations between them, as well as anomalies or errors, but not electrons. As a fundamental particle, all electrons have the exact same properties. Noticing this fact, and the seeming correspondence between electrons and time-reversed positrons, physicist John Wheeler proposed the one-electron universe arguing that every electron in the universe, as well as every positron, was in fact part of the same entity, a single electron whizzing back and forth through time and space like it was stuck in a giant pinball machine. Wheeler first proposed this idea to Richard Feynman in a telephone call in the spring of 1940. Feynman, I know why all electrons have the same charge and the same mass. Why? Because they are all the same electron. Suppose that the world lines, which we were ordinarily considering before in time and space, instead of only going up in time, were a tremendous knot, and then we cut through the knot by the plane corresponding to a fixed time. We would see many, many world lines, and that would represent many electrons. Except for one thing. If in one section this is an ordinary electron world line, in the section in which it reversed itself and is coming back from the future, we have the wrong sign to the proper time, to the proper four velocities, and that's equivalent to changing the sign of the charge, and therefore that part of a path would act like a positron. But professor, there aren't as many positrons as there are electrons. Well, maybe they are hidden in the protons or something. The idea did a good job at explaining a few phenomena. The eerie sameness of electrons I mentioned earlier, as well as the behavior of positrons as time-reversed electrons, would be explained by this theory. Furthermore, when electrons and positrons interact, they annihilate one another and emit a photon. Under this understanding of the universe, electron-positron annihilation wouldn't be the interaction of two particles, but the act of one particle changing direction in time. However, this theory has some glaring holes, even in its day. Feynman's first reaction to this theory was to ask why there were more electrons in the universe than positrons. This asymmetry is unexplained to this day, and invalidates the theory. If all the electrons in the universe were in fact one particle moving backward and forward through time, then for every forward trip of an electron, there would have to be a corresponding backwards trip that behaves like a positron. Otherwise, how could the electron travel forward through time again? While Wheeler half-jokingly proposed that the electrons were hiding in protons, advances in particle physics since 1940 have revealed to us the composition of protons. Two up quarks and one down quark. No electrons or positrons to be found. When a neutron decays into a proton, a down quark becomes an up quark and releases a W boson. This carrier of the weak force quickly decays into an electron and an antineutrino. This spontaneous creation of an electron cannot be explained because the W boson and antineutrino are both fundamental particles that do not behave like time-reversed electrons. The same can be said for the process of electron capture, where a proton becomes a neutron, after releasing a W boson that converts the electron into a neutrino. Before the interaction, there is one electron. After the interaction, there are no electrons or positrons, so the electron was genuinely destroyed. Despite the failure of the whole of this theory, parts of it actually led to revelations in particle physics. 
In 1948, Richard Feynman came up with the Feynman Diagram, a graphical representation of particle interactions that graphs time on one axis and space on another. These diagrams are still used today, as they are useful for visualizing interactions as well as calculating probabilities on the quantum scale. In 1965, Feynman won the Nobel Prize in Physics, largely due to these diagrams, and during his speech, he credited Wheeler for his contribution. I did not take the idea that all the electrons were the same one from him as seriously as I took the observation that positrons could simply be represented as electrons going from the future to the past in a back section of their world lines. That I stole. In fact, this idea is so integral to Feynman diagrams that positrons receive backwards arrows in their representation, whereas electrons receive forward arrows. The same is true for all particles of antimatter and matter respectively, because just like positrons, all antiparticles behave like time-reversed versions of their counterparts. Looking at two Feynman diagrams, one for two electrons repelling each other, and one for electron-positron annihilation, you can see that they are both the same interaction, just rotated with respect to space and time. While the one-electron universe didn't pan out, it was incredibly useful to advancing physics. Thinking of antimatter as time-reversed matter is useful for thinking about and calculating quantum interactions. It just goes to show that out-of-the-box thinking is always useful in science. While not every idea will stick, some will result in great strides forward.